being here. Yeah. I was going to open with a question like, uh, how's Australia treating you so far? I've only been here like an hour. So. <laughs> or an hour and a half. We'll, by the time the end of this, we'll, we'll have a better uh, chat about that. Um, you and I have known each other for a long time, for two decades, more. We were colleagues together at CUA. We turned up together at the first, on the first day for both of us, teaching. I have a vivid memory of that and then being lost in the semester. So let's open with, with what led you to the profession of, of law and then maybe the, the academy as well. Um, first, I just want to say thank you for having me and I'm aware I'm in a room with people of enormous amounts of varied accomplishments, so I don't want to go blah, 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 I did this. <laughs> but I, I really do want it to be of service, um, maybe a little entertainment. And, I'm, uh, and so I, I really am striving to be that. Um, uh, but in any event, for those of you who aren't lawyers or those of you who are, <laughs> um, I went into law because America is ruled by lawyers. And um, because I grew up at a time when, um, uh, I wanted to be something specific and useful. And um, I was, you know, I'm 63, like the first generation to sort of want to aspire to have this professional career and, and children and everything. I mean, women had, many women had done it before, but then the majority of women were trying to do it by the time I came along. Um, I had two experiences that led me to think this was a thing to do that could be useful in American society. Uh, one, I had um, my late disabled sister who got pushed around a lot. And she was older than me, but I was, her, I was told by my parents, you're her advocate. You know, go out there and make sure nobody pushes her around. Uh, and then second, <laughs> this will make you laugh, when I was discerning whether I should be a contemplative nun, <laughs> they like had me out of there in like two hours. <laughs> it was like, I just didn't think so hell. And it was the Sisters of the Perpetual Adoration of the, of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, the Pink Sisters in Philly, in Philadelphia. <clears throat> so that summer I tried them, and then I was like, well, maybe I should try something else. So um, I moved to West Virginia and worked in the prisons there. And... Um, uh, I actually became the prison chaplain because they, they didn't have one. It was a maximum security prison. And I got so catcalled by the, you know, the expression catcalling the prisoners would yell when I came through. I, I shaved my head so I would look like a young guy. Um, and I worked in the prison that summer. And I was like, yep, lawyer. <clears throat> I want to be in the system. I want to do something. And I was with the prisoners several days a week. And then I was with their wives, my mother, girlfriends, nobody was married, and their children and social workers. And I thought, I want to be in the governmental system and see what I can do. So, and then academia, because I just always love to, for, I don't know how many of you were in academia, but you know, I just can't read enough. And sometimes I get ideas that I have to write about that if I don't get it out, it will consume me. So, and then I love students. I mean, I think that's all of our favorite part about academia is no matter what we kvetch about, otherwise we want to be with the students. So. You see Christ in every student. You know, I do. Um, and as you get older, especially because my children are there. So I have, a, I have two kids uh, uh, in, in different PhDs, so they're still students in their late 20s. And then my youngest kid just graduated college. So I have an economist, a theologian, and an artist. And um, uh, I, once you have them, um, everybody is like your kid, right? And then for me, because I'm a bit aggressive and ambitious, I had to sort of um, a discipline, a spiritual discipline, was to see everybody and say, sister in Christ, brother in Christ, and to, 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 to put that first before I encounter the person, because sometimes I would be too competitive or too brusque or too on my way to something else you know, and just ride roughshod over people. So that actually, the sister and brother in Christ, just a quick story on that. I had a student from Korea who was very, very alone during the first COVID um, season. And she was in an apartment alone near the university. And she was online with me and she looked really miserable. And I said, um, her name was Sui. And I was like, hey, why don't you, is there anybody you know at school? Why don't you come over to my house for breakfast? <clears throat> just bring, you know, let's all just take off our masks and get sick together. Come on over to my house. <laughs> um, no, but we weren't sick. We were fine. Um, my university actually went back in person in fall of 2020. 
<clears throat> and you could be online, but we also, half the students chose to be in a classroom with me and half online. Anyway, I have her over, and at breakfast, she says to me, why are you doing this for me? And I was like, well, you seem really lonely, you know. And she goes, well, there are a lot of people, you know. <clears throat> why are you doing this for me? And I said, well, I'm just going to be frank. And I, used, I said, well, I think of you as my sister in Christ. And she was a, an atheist, and she put her head, she had these tiny little shoulders, on my kitchen table and just wept. And I didn't even know all that was behind that. But I said, that's, that's kind of the deeper reason for me, you know. Um, and... You, you're the person in, in need in my orbit <clears throat> at this moment. Um, and we just became great friends. That was her first semester in school. And that, I mean, that just speaks to people. Um, even if they don't fully know what it means, it means <clears throat> that we're on the same plane and that somebody loves you. God loves you the same way he loves me. So it's funny you say that because that was the expression I used with her and it had such, a, such an effect that I didn't anticipate. So going back into the classroom there was a kind of missionary thing in a sense and it also speaks to some aspects of the theology of the body because you need to be present and teaching over Zoom is maybe not present in the same way that you are when you're physically available to people, which is my segue into the second question, which is what do you actually teach okay. in, in day to day? Yeah, I'll give you a tiny little background of that. So I used to work in... First, I was a lawyer for a big firm, and I did litigation, and the Catholic Church and about seven other kinds of churches were my clients in Philly. It was a firm that specialized in, in some religious freedom. And then I come to DC, I work for the bishops as an attorney, and someone said, hey, we need sort of a big mouth who doesn't mind going on TV <clears throat> in the pro-life office who would also lobby, and da -da -da, would you do that? So I did, and one year I spent with post-aborted women and I was told, I want you to spend lots of time and really figure out, and this was one particular bishop who ran the committee asked me to do that. And, and that's actually, I say that as background because that led me into family law <clears throat> because I, I hadn't practiced family law, like I did a little bit here and there. I was a corporate litigator mostly and then religious freedom. That's what I did for my firm. And I was so blown away by the stories of these women and what led them to the final decision to have an abortion that I was like, oh, this is so much bigger. You know, this is about how they grew up. This is about relationships with men. This is about women. This is about parenting. This is about marriage. It's about all that stuff. And I want to get into that. So when I came to <clears throat> uh, start at Catholic University before I was at George Mason, I asked to teach family law. And then I taught family law for a while, and I could see that what the church was promoting as norms was actually social justice for romantic and family partners. <laughs> I mean, it really is. It's, it's the Good Samaritan principle for romantic and familial relations. And I was so impressed by this that, and then this was about the time when the US government started to get kind of hostile to the Catholic Church on these issues, and other Christian churches in particular, right? So I started, I came to family law from the pro-life issue. And then I only came to religious freedom beginning in about 2003 when I could see that the church's witness on these issues was being really squashed. And I said, no, 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 this witness is such a service to society, particularly to women and the poor. Um, I, I, I looked at some of your data before I got here, but in the US, the poor suffer loss of stable family relations um, more than the wealthy and the well-educated. The poor really have a dearth of those resources more than the well-off do. <clears throat> and so the church was such a service to the vulnerable, and yet the government was trying to shut us down. So that's sort of how I laddered into family law, and then I laddered into religious freedom. And now I, I write books and articles in both, and I teach both. So my specialties are family law, where I say to my students, hey, this isn't a divorce course. And they're like, oh, really? I thought that was all of family law. <laughs> no, it's about family relations, right? And then I teach a, a law and religion seminar. So that's your day job. And then after that, you consult <coughs> to the UN, and you, you, you're working for the USCCB, the US I Conference did, yeah. of Catholic Bishops. And then you, this segues into work for the church and, and, and for the Vatican. There's a lot there. Uh, is, is there a theme that we can draw out of that, out of that work? And how did it start? Um, 
So some of you work inside the church, I know, <clears throat> and some of you work elsewhere. Um, but if and when your faith is important to you, whether you work inside or, or outside, right, you're going to be called to do things that are vocational for you, right? And um, for me, I just, it's, it's hard to explain. My, my father was an immigrant from Cuba to the US. <clears throat> uh, my mother's Irish. Um, she did speak Spanish fluently, though, go mom. And uh, she was acceptable to the other side. Um, and I grew up with this love of the church. Just, they were so, they weren't just Catholic. They were like, they were in love with it. I, I have a, a memory that is a true memory of when I, um, they built the new church that I grew up in. It was St. Catherine of Siena outside of Philly. And uh, I remember we were shown the church and my parents walked out and I remember dancing around the aisle of the church when I was a little girl going, this is mine too. This is my place. This is my second home. I just felt such affection for it. <clears throat> and then I had this fab training, mostly with nuns, through 12th grade. Uh, I had lay teachers and nuns. I went to all-girls school. And the combination of faith and reason, these nuns were like super smart, and they were also very holy. And I just for me, it was just so interesting. It was never boring. Um, if, if, if this was true stuff, then it was worth spending a lot of time on. And so being academically oriented, I could never read enough. I could never think enough about it. And so even when I started law school, I remember thinking, this is for the church. So I was at an Ivy League university where this was not really popular. <laughs> I, I was treated like, I went to Cornell in New York. It was one of the, <clears throat> it's a very fine school, but I remember people thinking even then, she's Catholic and she's really into it, so she can only be so smart. You know, she's, she's, she's a little fideistic or a little irrational. Um, and, and that, I think that drove me too, being a little ambitious, is I have to be a little better. I have to know my data. I have to know the footnotes. I have to be the smartest person in the room when I come in to say something controversial. So it really drove me to research, um, to sort of hold my head up high as a Catholic. And so after I worked for this big firm that represented the church as his clients, I was like, this isn't enough, right? The church is my clients, but I want to be serving the church all the time. So my husband, uh, born and raised in DC, needed to move back there from Philly for his job. He did US-Japan trade relations was his thing. My husband, I won't cry, he died two years ago very suddenly, but um, so I can't talk about that here. Uh, anyway, he moved me to DC and uh, he did international trade and I applied for a job with all the US bishops. And I got it and then I did their Supreme Court work on all the neuralgic issues, anti-capital punishment, um, uh, pro-life, euthanasia, religious freedom. It was like, I was just a target. Um, and then someone asked me to do, to be their public face. So it's like one thing just led to another, led to another. And it started with just a love for the, for the faith and the church. The church, weirdly. Um, because most people don't say that, oh, that's an institution. But to me, it was this, right? So just to give some perspective on that, this is the USCCB, the US Conference of Catholic Bishops. <laughs> How many bishops is that? 300 and some. Okay. So you're out in front on CNN? Yeah, we, we it was really crazy. Uh, did it everywhere. I came here for World Youth Day, and I had to do all the nasty interviews. They, they shipped out this whole bunch of, like, oh, at the time it was like Cokie Roberts, Sam Donaldson, they, all these sort of big guns. They shipped them out here to do some interviews. And my favorite memory from that World Youth Day interview was um, I decided to throw them off their game a little to get started. And I said to them, now listen, I just want to get it straight. You're obsessed with sex, not me, right? And I was like, you're going to ask me about priestly celibacy, sex abuse, abortion, contraception, and same-sex unions, right? Is that what you're planning? And I was like, because I just want to let you know there's a lot more to the Catholic faith than that and what you know the Pope is here talking about. But I just figured that's all you want to talk about. <laughs> 
And so that was my opening salvo, because I knew they just wanted to nail us on all these issues. So I thought, whatever question they ask me, I'm going to start by saying, you're obsessed with these issues, right? That's all you want to ask me? If there's anything else you want to know about the church, I just want you to know I'm here to help. <laughs> but if that's all you're interested in, we'll just do that. <laughs> At that point, they wished you'd become a contemplative nun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, <laughs> Sam Donaldson was, was not happy. But I just, that was what I had to put up with all the time. And sometimes it would be four or five against one. I wonder if it was 11 against one on a panel. Yeah. So that's tough. So you, you can only do that for so long, right? And then you move to another phase, which is what? So it was more, not that I couldn't do it forever. I, I liked it. But at a certain point, I thought, people are just going to think I'm this talking head. I was doing it out of this huge well of desire to manifest our faith as smart and good and for the common good. Um, but if you do that forever and ever and ever and ever, they're like, oh, here's the lady who always says X. And I thought, no, I need to stop that or else I'm just this talking head who always does that. So I had always wanted to be an academic. Um, when I took the job at the Bishop's Conference, I was most of the way through my PhD in theology at Catholic U, and Cardinals O'Connor of New York and Bernardine of Chicago ganged up together to get me to take the pro-life job. So I left the PhD, but I, I kind of wanted to be a prof. And so after being the Bishop's public representative and lobbyist for 10 years, I just was like, now I can do my dream of teaching. And, and then I've been a professor for 25 years now. So the students that you're teaching are how old? You know, it's interesting. I don't know about yours. Our average age in law school is 26. What's yours? 18, 19. But don't you have grad school in law too? We do, but it's not a graduate degree. Oh, okay. So, so ours are about 26, although I have so a- they're married. Some of them are married. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have a lot of married. And because we have a night school, we have a lot of people who work on Capitol Hill and a lot of people who've had work experience before. Um, I just taught a girl last year. She was a PhD physicist from Princeton. And I was like, why are you in my class? <laughs> like, what can I possibly tell? Uh, she was amazing. So you get like some like people who are second career. Um, and uh, it's a great school. It's a very free speechy, civil discourse kind of place. So how does a group of 25 year olds, some married, some with kids, some not, cope with with your, your take on family law, which comes from a, a religious impetus? Because I don't give them my take. Okay. I teach Tell at us. a public university. And of course, nothing is hidden from anyone anymore. Everybody knows who you are. They go research, they look at my Supreme Court briefs, they look at my articles, the books, et cetera. But what I do is I do this intro to kind of, like let's say family law, uh, again, the first principle of communication, right? Don't tell people what you know. Tell them what you need them to believe, right? <laughs> so I start on my very first day in family law. And I say, listen, I know you all know, you know, my reputation, what I do, what I write. But let me just tell you some things about this class. I'm telling them what I need them to understand and believe. <clears throat> first of all, I teach it straight out. I do both sides of every question. Second, don't think that I'm some kind of like, you know, Catholic Puritan who hasn't seen one of everything in this book. And I usually hold up the index. I have 135 relatives just on the Cuban side. And I'm like, I just go through and I'm like, adoption, yeah. New reproductive technologies, yeah. Same-sex unions, yeah. Uh, uh, divorce, yeah. You know, I said, everything in this book, I've got two of, just on one side of my family. I'm like, you can't freak me out, but you do have to know your stuff. Because I said, we do both sides of everything. And I don't give you my opinion. I don't ask you to meet with my opinion. We grade exams uh, blindly. And it's about your knowledge of the law. And I said, in turn, I don't want to hear about your politics. I don't want to hear about your culture. I don't want to hear about um, uh, your, your theological take on something. And I won't give you mine. You know, We really are here to talk about the law. And sometimes sociology, culture, et cetera, intersect. But we only discuss them insofar as they intersect with an argument about what the law ought to be. So I, I, in family law in particular, I start with a like, here's the ground, so that they don't have to worry that I'm there to give them my take on things. Now, sometimes they get angry because I do make them read both sides of things, because most students come in on one side of things. But when we read the majority, we read the dissent. 
When the majority quotes sociology on one side, we look at the sociology on the other side. Um, and I feel like, and usually the reviews that come in say, yeah, we looked at both sides. Um, even if I, when I taught at a Catholic university, I might bring in more Catholic social teaching, but I would be really doing a disservice to students if you didn't give them the arguments on the other side and make us fight our way through them. So, and we'll, we'll segue into, into the next phase, which maybe was working for the Vatican, but before we do, can you give us your 60-second elevator pitch on faith and reason? Because <coughs> if, if you're faithful, you can be, like, you've, you're, you don't have a head, you've got a pumpkin up there. Like, you're, you're just not... <laughs> You're not taken seriously right. in, in intellectual circles, particularly at times. It depends on where the person is starting from, but I do point out that the entire kind of idea of a university and its first incarnations actually came from the Catholic Church. <laughs> and they're kind of shocked to find that out. Um, second, I say, you know, again, don't tell people what you know, tell them what you need them to believe. I say, as a reasonable person, as a person who wants to be fair in our conversation, I'm sure you've looked at the Catholic or the Christian or whatever we're talking about, <clears throat> uh, take on um, reason and intellect. And you understand that because we believe that God created the human person in full, that God also created the universe and everything that's in it, including reason. <laughs> so I said, we don't, not, not only do we not dislike reason, we embrace it absolutely fully. And I'm assuming that you've taken a look at our tradition on that before we're going to have a debate on that. OK, so the next little question here is about being a Catholic and a professional and living a professional life. Has that got more difficult over the years, do you think? Or do we, yeah, what, what can we look forward to in addition coming, going, going forward on that? on that front. So it would be interesting to know if this was the case also in Australia. I think, I'm going back, say, even to the 60s and 70s, um, the idea that a person was a person of faith would have been to their credit, to their advantage in the professional world. It would have been thought, oh, this person has an ethical grid, <laughs> and that's a good thing. <clears throat> Now, and this is such an interesting and huge question, and I know you have a similar set of circumstances as we do, since what I generally call the sexual expression issues, in the US it includes all kinds of government things on contraception, but here it also includes, I think, abortion, same-sex unions, <coughs> uh, transgender um, issues. Um, they so dominate the cultural and media and even electoral landscape that, and, and corporate America, and I don't know about corporate Australia, is so much a player in culture and economics and politics that if a faith is associated with something less than the new sexual orthodoxy, it becomes very, it be, you're, you're playing on the defense a bit. Now I, you know, just refuse. <laughs> um, my sister owns a PR agency, and you walk in her agency, and on the wall it says, be bold, be brief, be gone. And I kind of like, I want to sort of set people off, like, just so they're not attacking me to begin with. I don't want to start with an attack. And I just, so I, I, I want to assure them that, you know, I'm there <clears throat> um, to be a first class member of my profession and to be reasonable and to be fair and to be knowledgeable. And that my faith only affirms this. And I'll just use confident and bold words like it never undercuts it. It never contradicts it. It only affirms it. I feel like, I know that's, it's, I feel like I can't go half measures on that in order to make people understand how strongly this is true or how strongly I feel about this. That, that it's, I, I, I would not say something that couldn't be, couldn't be shown empirically or philosophically or, or in some other discipline. But then I, my faith would affirm that reasonable thing, not undercut it, and add really some additional beauty and light. So you find that the data is on, is on, on par with what the church Teachers, for example, in relation to women or families. Yes. Can you give us some examples? Right. 
It's in, and let me add here, and Pope Benedict says this, I think it's in the Deus Caritas Death, God, His Love, His First um, Encyclical. He said, listen, the church has, you know, has, has I forget how he puts it. I wish he's so much more nuanced and, and, uh, than I can speak it here. But we've had very missteps in the tone uh, and direction of our speaking about sex, about the sexual issues. John Paul II, in his letter to women and some other statements about women, has, has owned up to the church having made tremendous missteps on this in the past, right? I, I'm not saying we're some kind of perfect, otherworldly, you know, without original sin, it's not at all, right? I'm saying that when you keep exploring and clear away the problems and get to the best theology, to scriptural interpretations that, that really get to the heart of things, that um, what's been true really since the first century to today in the church's teachings on sex, marriage, and parenting is actually very freeing. It's a great relief. I, I often recommend to people two books, Kyle Harper's From Shame to Sin and Rodney Stark, The Rise of Christianity. They're just amazing talking about the, the, the rise of the Christian thinking about this versus the Roman system and how there was a reason why women and slaves in particular were super attracted to the Christian message in the beginning. Um, another writer, Sarah Rudin, a Yale classic scholar in her book, Paul Among the People, talks about this, that you know, imagine being told, OK, we're not abiding by the Roman system anymore. Men don't get to do stuff because they're men. <laughs> that men and women are now on a par. There's the same system for everybody in terms of sexual marital parenting ethics. Um, masters and slaves, no difference in, in, in the ethics that apply to everybody. <clears throat> a man can't write home to his pregnant wife and say, if it's a girl or if the baby is sick, leave it on the hill to die. Or I'm bringing home a new wife. Or I divorce thee, I divorce thee, I divorce thee. You know, it was... Uh, Sarah Rudin says so beautifully in her book about it, she says, she said it wasn't a contest for purity, it was rather a promotion of an abundance of life. It was a statement that people were no longer to be treated as things. Um, from the very beginning, this, what, what Kyle Harper calls Christianity's conspicuous chastity, was seen as a break from the world's allowance of different rules for people depending on your higher status in society, and a break from using people or treating other people's bodies like they didn't have a sacred quality. And yes, we have in the church treated women as second class citizens over time, and it goes up and down. Um, we're in a better period now. Um, and we have, uh, you know, spoken about sex in ways that sort of seem to forget that God made it and therefore it is good. Um, but we have come a long way, the theology of the body. And today, empirics, which I follow rather doggedly, affirm more than any other period in history that the church's teachings about sex, marriage, and parenting are actually very freeing. They're the things that result in people having a more secure, stable existence. And they are particularly kind uh, to the poor, to children, and to women. I, I, I write about this in a lot of different places, but that's kind of a summary of where I go. For some reason, I've, I've got to ask you about those who came before as women, and I'm thinking of Mary Ann Glendon. You do, do, I don't know if you know Mary Ann Glendon. She, she was my mentor since the 80s. She taught the exact same things I teach, but she taught them at Harvard. So that's why everybody knows Marianne. I'm like, I'm like her, the, the one who carries Marianne's baggage. I think she's in her 80s now, and she's still doing amazing stuff. Then she became the ambassador to the Vatican. She, when I was having little babies in the 90s, Marianne did the Cairo and Beijing conferences, and I just wrote all her, her, her press statements from, from the, the comfort of my children's nursery back in DC. Um, and Marianne was representing the Vatican at the UN conferences on women and on um, population and development. Um, her, the other thing about, that Marianne taught me and why she was a mentor to me and so many other women is that uh, she helped us avoid getting political. 
that we don't track with political parties in the United States. And I live in DC. If you're keeping track of it now, you just want to be there. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. I can't even read it. I can't even read it. I have to stay away. I look for the articles. It's like articles about like, oh, there's a new kind of root beer that they've invented in Alabama. I mean, I'll read anything except stuff about Trump and Kamala right now. Um, uh, anyway, Marianne was sort of a pioneer in follow your intellectual lights, follow faith and reason, try to be the smartest person in the room on the narrow things that you're working on. Use your career as service. Take your licks. I mean, Marianne was doing this from Harvard. You know, I mean, among the most famous law professor, you know, colleagues in the world, and she's willing to do this. Um, so she is a shining light and remains a shining light to all of us. Another woman in the U.S., Erica Bakiaki, who just wrote a biography of, of Wollstonecraft. Um, there's just. I wrote a, a Supreme Court brief with um, Erica Bakiaki and Teresa Collette from University of St. Thomas. We got 240 women, JD, PhD, MD, um, to support the pro-life side. We wrote this highly empirical brief about how abortion had not freed women in the United States. And Justice Alito cited it in his majority opinion in overturning Roe. We were very excited. But we, we said it was only women with terminal degrees because everyone thinks pro-life women are stupid. So we were like, you had to have a JD, a PhD, or an MD to get on the brief. Sorry, we just wanted to prove we weren't stupid because everybody says we are. And, and we wrote this, this really cool brief with Teresa Collette, Erica Bakiaki, and then all these other brave women who were willing to stand up and be counted. So there's, there's hundreds. There's hundreds, if not just, thousands. Just for context's sake, to be cited by the US Supreme Court or the Supremes, um, not, the, not the singing group, but the, um, is, is, is not an easy thing, OK? Um, I think. The, the comparison between the two legal systems is, it, it, it's just massive. It really is extraordinary. And Supreme Court justices are treated like rock stars. Yeah, they are. Or, or you know, enemy number one. <clears throat> Either one. They're one or the other. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, there's like memes, there's bobbleheads. There's, uh, well, you go into any law, law school and, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, swag is everywhere. <clears throat> uh, she's probably the most rock star of all of them. Okay, so slight slight change of pace. Spiritual support for you in in engaging with this. When we, when we started, we 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 talked about see Christ in in your friends and in your enemies. What what helps you at whatever level you you want to talk about it to to maintain the 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 serenity. And, and connectedness. You're assuming I have any, well, I'm just saying. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Whatever you want to call it. I don't mind, whatever you want to call it. But we, we've got to come back to base. So how do you do that? And maybe what advice would you give, particularly for young people, uh, on how to do that? Well, I'm sure everyone here has a strategy that I mine will overlap with in many ways. Um, so there is that when you work inside the church, and I... I especially when I was doing work for the Vatican or for the Permanent Observer Mission at the UN or stuff, there's a, there's a tendency to have pride that you need to just slap out of yourself at that. And it becomes about the church, the religion, and you lose sight of being a child of God and doing God's will. And that, that can happen easily. And you, there's, it can become about politics and prestige inside the institution, same way it could be in any large institution. And that is a terrible thing. And I, I, you know, I've got to stop confessing it because if I believe in the, in the sacrament, I've been forgiven. Um, but um, I, I knew I needed to get back to base, as you, as you so well put it. Um, I would say I tried and tried and tried throughout my career always, but then when my husband died suddenly, I crashingly had to come back to base. And I had to understand why I even still wanted to live. What was I doing here? Did God have any point for me at all? You know, I just felt extra in the world. Your kids are raised. You're not number one for anyone anymore. You've lost the person who's loved you since you were 17. Um, and I was like, God, I really need to get in touch with your will in a huge way. Um, I 
did several things. I had uh, my pastor, who, by the way, was a former stunt driver for Range Rover. He was a <laughs> wild child, and this is why I love him. Um, he had a conversion back to his faith in his late 30s. Um, he became my spiritual director because he doesn't put up with anything. He's like seen it all. <laughs> I, needed a, I needed an older guy who lived a little. <laughs> um, he's my spiritual director and he holds my feet to the fire and I absolutely could not live with it. He stood by my husband's bed with me when my husband was dying and said the three hardest things I've ever heard in my life and I thought, you, I need, I need you to to hold my feet to the fire from now on. Second, um, I really do spend much more time in prayer. You know, I pray at least three times a day. It's the first thing, it's the middle thing, it's the last thing. <clears throat> and I do a lot of spiritual reading. Um, I also try in God's presence, and you're gonna say, really? I try to shut up. I knew, I knew you'd get it already, and I've only been here in Australia for an hour and three quarters, um, and, and listen. And um, uh, one of my, I have, I have several great spiritual guides, um, Luigi Giussani, Communion and Liberation, um, Walter Chiswick, um, and, and for, for any of you who have read his book, whether it was With God in Russia or He Leadeth Me, he makes a statement, and after my husband's passing, I clang, clung on to it for dear life because um, I just, nothing seemed to, there seemed to be no purpose and nothing mattered at all. And I'm, I'm still sort of, <laughs> still struggling with that. But Walter Chiswick, when he's stuck in the gulag and realizes... He's a Je Jesuit, right? He's, he's stuck a Jesuit. in Russian he, prisons He's for... captured, and he's in the gulag for like 23 years, and... He, he, he makes some mistakes. He thinks he can, you know, outsmart his captors. And no, they, they actually outsmart him several times. And he fails and rises up again. And he just talks about God is in the circumstances that are put in front of you, in the people, in the things that happen. It's very, it's very Jesuit, Ignatian spirituality. Um, and I, I do spend time every day reviewing what God has sent and praying to receive it and to understand it and to respond to it. Um, and and just, it, it's just, it's a whole part of returning to base, which is being available to do God's will as opposed to a lady who does stuff for the church and is kind of the wind-up energizer bunny who's like always done this stuff for the church. No, I, I have first to be in relationship with God, but that was a struggle. Right, right. And, and you were talking about families before, and families are places where, where beautiful things happen and people get wounded as well. Um, and so living that out, particularly with, with children maybe, I just wanted if you had some, some insights there, both through the lens of your, your students but also your kids, in terms of the kinds of difficulties that face parents <coughs> in, this, in this time, in, in raising kids in the faith and also confronting a secular culture. Yes. It would violate my kids' privacy to explain to you <clears throat> all that we've been through. <laughs> but rest assured, um, it doesn't look like what um, American shows were uh, Little House on the Prairie or The Waltons. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted them to be unafraid of the world. And so the two oldest went to U Chicago. You know, the, you know the expression there, where fun goes to die. Uh, but it's also like really, really, really heady. I wanted them to have faith and reason. So I, I sent them to a place where they would learn, where they would have a great um, Newman Center and intense philosophical training. And then they both did philosophy. And they both, uh, the ones there did the Newman Center. Then the youngest one went to Parsons School of Design, which is an art school in New York. So they have really been in the world and what can I say? Um, so I, first of all, thought I'd never have kids. I ended up being pregnant seven times and miscarrying four, so I clearly went whole hog in the other direction. Um, I had to trust God in that because I was terrified of having children, especially because of my disabled sister. Once I was pregnant at 46, and I remember saying to God, please let the disability be physical. Please let it be physical, not mental, because my sister's mental disability was so hard on her. Um, uh, and 
Learning to be a parent first, it wasn't a question of balance, but a question of priority. That was really hard for me, because I was like, go, 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 go. Um, I remember my mother coming to visit me after the first child and saying something like, imagine, Helen, if you were to not work and stay home. I mean, what would it be like? What would you do your first day? And I was like, oh, I'd totally be job hunting. I mean, like, that would be my, like, I just, I, I just, so, but what I did do was, was, I had worked, 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 worked so hard before they were born that I was like, okay, I've earned some goodwill, now I'm gonna demand some flexibility. And I'm gonna change and I'm gonna back off the intensity. And so I took less money, less hours, and, and when I moved into academia, uh, was far more available uh, when at that point they were five, three, and, and just about newly born, and I was pregnant. Um, so, and then tried to put faith first for them. We all know osmosis is over when it comes to trying to bring your kids along in the faith, so it was important to have conversations with them. I always say every parent is a homeschooler, even if your kids are full-time at some school. You've got to have these conversations. When my youngest son was, was bullied like crazy, the artist, he was neither an athlete nor an academic, and he was really bullied at this all-boys Jesuit high school in D.C. called Gonzaga, and I had to pull him out. And the only school we could find for him was a public school, which, you know, I didn't think my parents, anyone in the, in the Spanish side had been to a public school maybe since the beginnings of their, their faith. Who knew? So I was like totally freaked out. And uh, I said, okay, I'm just going to teach you religion four nights a week. That's the deal, right? And it was so fruitful to engage in these conversations with them. Um, using Walter Chiswick and Pope Benedict and Gisani and, you know, having these cool conversations with them. So, um, so I gave a lot of time over to that and just did have to back off of work. But it was hard for me because my tendency was to just keep working. <laughs> um, so it was, it was a discipline to stop it and to be a mother first. I bet they're glad you didn't become a contemplative nun. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so you're an academic, and when academics are in an interview, a job interview, they, they ask not so much the question about where do you see yourself in five years, because it's, it's not a corner office question. It's about what you're, you're thinking and the trajectory of your, of your scholarship. So where do you see yourself heading in the next five to ten years in that arena? Yes. So, um, you know, they talk about if any of you are academics or, you know, even if you're like in a management job where you have to sort of project where the company's going to go in X amount of time, um, you know, yes, you want to have this concept. You, you want to have a vision before you move forward, right? Um, and what I discovered in family law is the vision came really quickly, and it was in part I, I've, I've only written a couple of articles where I explicitly talk about <coughs> Catholicism in it, where I, where I do that. Mostly, however, I'm reasoning from a Catholic understanding of the world, which is supported by empirical data, sociology, philosophy, psychology, economics, etc. cetera. Um, and what I discovered was that American family law scholarship, it is so ideological. And what I discovered really early on, I was like trying to respond to some of these articles, which were so stupid. I was like, what? what am I trying to get at here? And I realized it was their anthropology. That they, they were all starting from an anthropology that bore no relationship to how human beings actually think of sex, marriage, or parenting. And so, for instance, there were articles about, like, if we just pour enough money into cohabiting households, then eventually they'll, they'll have the same output data. The children will be as stable, the academic, the emotional, the cognitive, the employment data will... The, there were articles just saying if we pour enough money into programs for you know, high school single mothers, <clears throat> if we convince them that they are self-maximizing monads and, and we just want to set them up for their individualist, economically successful future, then that's the right government program. And instead, these young women were going, well, actually, I wanted to be a gift to somebody. I actually wanted to have this child. Um, I would actually like to have the father in my life. I didn't actually just want, you know, a, a, a ticket to a community college and, and, and a plan for a budget. 
Like they didn't, the government programs, they never worked, by the way. None of these programs worked because they had the wrong anthropology. The only program that ever worked to help young single high school mothers was a program where they actually performed service for other people, 70 hours a semester, that allowed them to be a gift to some. So I would say, what's the anthropology behind these articles that seem like complete nonsense to me? And I would discover that, that indeed it was nonsense. So my trajectory became unearthing the anthropology of articles that seemed like nonsense. And saying, hey, not Catholics have a different one, but let's go to the data. What are the women themselves saying? What are the young girls saying? What does the data say about the outcomes that we get when we do X versus Y? And then more quickly, in the religious freedom arena, the second area of my scholarship, my main work, the greatest resistance to religious freedom, and this may also be true in Australia, or I may be overstating it a bit, but is because of the Christian church's positions on sex, marriage, and parenting now. It's sort of like, how can we let you people loose in public when this is what you think? How can we allow your witness to stand, right? Um, how can we allow you to ask for a right to discriminate against other people? How can we allow you to demand a religious freedom exemption to be unchristian? That's basically, so my goal there has been to assist religious institutions to articulate their call for religious freedom as a call to, 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 um, to act in the public good for the common good. <clears throat> Never to just say, I have a right. I have a right to religious freedom. It's in section 116 of the Constitution. It's in one of the state or territory laws. It's in one of the non-discrimination laws exemptions. I have a right. We'd say, I've been granted this because I have a witness that does beautiful things for the most vulnerable members of society. You want our witness, and let me show you this. So I wrote my whole last book, Religious Freedom After the Sexual Revolution, is this effort. And as a result of it, a law firm uh, in, in Colorado that uh, does nothing but institutional religious freedom asked me to come back in. So I, I do some practice now with this firm. And my whole job is, is speaking when bishops and bishops conferences are involved in lawsuits. My job is to voice the church saying, not I have a right, but this is the provision where you have granted us a right to be who we are, and who we are is a beautiful thing for the society in which we're operating, let us tell you why. And so that's been my main, and I, that, that's gonna take so long, that ship is so listing in, in a bad direction that that will be my project, I think, for a very long time. So just so everyone knows that book, the title is? Religious Freedom After the Sexual Revolution. And I don't think it's yet on Kindle, but if everybody in the room goes home and ticks that box, it will be on Kindle. Okay. Um, I, got my, my, I had to have my copy flown, flown in. Oh, darn, I would have sent you one. Okay. I have one, I have one with me. <laughs> Helen, we're, we're about to, 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 to wind up, so I just want to, I want to thank you um, deeply, personally, and on behalf of everyone in the room, for sharing a, a piece of yourself after <coughs> such an extraordinary effort to even physically get here uh, to be with us. Today's the Feast of the Transfiguration, but you've been translated, you know, across <laughs> uh, multiple time zones. I don't know what time it is in DC I don't know. right I now. I left DC 48 hours ago <laughs> and just got here like two hours ago. So yeah, my brain is a little fried. So, that, so <laughs> that's, that's another form of transfiguration. <laughs> Um, but please, everybody, let's thank Helen for a tremendous... Mm -hmm.